Okay, so perhaps um, maybe let's make a start. Um, so welcome everyone to the, uh, to the afternoon session. Um, so I've been asked to remind everyone first uh, that the slides to the talk will appear in the chat at some point during the talk and also that the slides will be available on the conference website. Um, Eric, probably a, about five minutes before the end of the talk, I'll, I'll give you a reminder about the time. Um, and so, yeah, without further ado, um, we first, first up this afternoon, we have Eric Panzer, who's going to be talking about single valued iterated integrals in physics. Uh, th thank you very much uh, and welcome back everyone to the afternoon session. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's, it's my first time at this conference and I must apologize from the beginning that I'm probably quite an outsider to this community. So um, what I'm going to talk about may be a bit of a weird kind of question even to ask for, for some of you. So what I decided to do is to try to be very uh, explicit into a kind of lecture style. So I just want to explain some, some things about integrals. So, so I'm a person who is interested in integrals on, uh, well, on many spaces, but in particular Riemann surfaces as well. And this morning we, we had a talk by CD on, uh, which also referred to, to certain integrals, kind of regularized integrals with holomorphic poles on a Riemann surface. And it, it seems to be that string theory in many different uh, shapes and kinds and flavors um, tends to involve different kinds of integrals. And, you know, if, if, if you have the, an interest like me, these integrals in themselves can be very interesting, even though this, the questions that I'm asking may not uh, be particularly relevant for, for other questions with the physical background. So you, you will see. So, so what I decided to do is I'll try to, to give a couple of examples of different types of stringy kind of integrals and what I mainly want to talk about is this kind of uh, decomposition you see here on the first slide. So single valued integrals, what does this mean for me? So on the left-hand side here, um, you see a, an integral of a two form over a Riemann surface. Uh, so X is a Riemann surface, dz wedge dz bar. And this integrand F, I mean, that what that is depends on your theory, on, on your strings, topological or quantum field theoretical, whatever it may be. But so, so this F will not be completely random, but in general, it, it will have, it, it can have some poles, so the Riemann surface may have punctures um, and it will in general not be holomorphic. So this is why I write the Z and Z bar explicitly in the argument. So you have some real analytic two form you want to integrate on a Riemann surface. And in many cases that appear in practice, it turns out that you, you can decompose these things uh, as you see on the right-hand side. So there's a way to, to factorize them into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic things. So this integral U is, is you should think of this as a holomorphic uh, object and uh, the V bar, this is the conjugate of a holomorphic object. So that's an anti-holomorphic thing. And these integrals gamma that I write here, these are iterated path integrals. I will explain how this comes about. And there is some, um, specifications to be done here. So this is not always the factorization strictly of this type, but a similar kind of thing happens in some special cases. Um, so this is what I want to explain, this kind of structure that I'm sure many of you have seen in one flavor or the other um, and, and how this comes about. Uh, and please interrupt me if I, my connection breaks down or if you have any questions, I realize this is a kind of odd talk probably in this conference. Um, so to be a bit less vague, let me give a very explicit example here. So let's, let's take as a Riemann surface, just the punctured plane with three punctures, punctures at zero, one and a point P, whatever P is, it shouldn't be zero or one, so some other point. And let's look at this integral. So the integrating over this punctured plane, dz, dz bar, and the integral, I just told this little rational function. I mean, I say rational, but of course, it's not a rational function in the honest sense because it also has the z bar in the denominator. But in some sense, this you can think of this as a rational thing. And this integral, this converges. This is a well-defined integral. And it turns out to be two pi i log of absolute value p squared. And I will show you later one way to, to arrive at this result. 
even though there are many other ways how to compute this, but for now, just take this as a given. And then the idea is that you shouldn't think of log p squared as log of absolute value p squared, but you should rather think of it as the kind of the real part of log of p uh, or twice the real part of log of p. So you can, you should think of this as log of p plus log of p bar. And when you do this, you get the second line, which is the kind of decomposition I wrote at the beginning in a kind of degenerate form. So on the left-hand side, you have this integral of a real analytic two form. On the right-hand side, you have a linear combination of a holomorphic thing, log of p written as an integral, dz over z, and log of p bar. And this is what generalizes uh, in many situations. So in particular, I will be focusing most of the talk on the by now kind of classical situation where you have a punctured plane with several punctures. So that has to do with uh, closed strings in genus zero, tree level scattering. Um, there's also a quantum field theoretical application that I will briefly explain called graphical functions. But then I really wanna go on to, to generalizations of this. Um, so the second uh, example will be a case when the Riemann surface has a boundary so you should think of a punctured disk. Um, I write it as a half plane here, half plane model. And this is something that features, for example, in deformation quantization uh, from the Poisson Sigma model. So you have a topological quantum field theory on the disk. And this leads to this type of integrals. And thirdly, there is an application that um, where, where we go to genus one. So then we will look at punctures on the elliptic curve. And if you remember, this is the kind of situation we also saw this morning, uh, though there is a slight difference that uh, this morning we were looking at uh, functions that have holomorphic singularities. And here we're also allowing uh, anti-holomorphic ones. So this is the kind of uh, examples I wanna mention. And basically all I wanna do in this talk is to bring across a couple of ideas um, that play a role here. So one is uh, to use vibrations, so to, to do look at one variable at a time, then you're in a higher dimensional situation. This is, we've also seen this morning. And of course it's very natural. Uh, the second point is a regularized Stokes theorem, um, which is very intuitive, um, but I will explain this in a little bit more detail. And then the, the thing that's maybe slightly less familiar to, to people is the idea of iterated integrals. So, so here in the example on the top, we just had a single integral dz over z. But in general, you have to have to do iterations of these holomorphic and anti-holomorphic integrals, and I will explain that. Um, and finally, there is a, the key idea of single valuedness from the title of the talk, uh, which I will also uh, explain. So let's 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 jump into the first uh, example where I mean, why would you ever consider such a weird integral? Um, well, if you've never seen it before, so, so one way it can come about is in a string perturbation theory. Um, so I'm looking at a, a closed string and then you can think of its world sheet uh, as a Riemann surface. And suppose we're looking at four particle scattering and then you have an expansion in the genus and the particular string theory you're going to look at uh, will tell you what the actual measure is what you have to integrate. So these omega are some forms whose precise nature is given by the actual content of the string theory. But the geometric content is that you're integrating over all the Riemann surfaces of the corresponding type. So in tree level, this is meaning genus zero, um, you will only integrate over the, the Riemann sphere uh, and the position of the punctures on it. And then at the next level you have an elliptic curve or you go to genus two and so on. Um, and the, as mentioned already, the, the idea is for, for how to compute these integrals is that you will want to use these um, functorial vibrations. So if uh, this fracture M, so this is the modelized space of genus G Riemann surfaces with N mark points. So then, then you have a natural map that forgets the nth point, right? So if, you're, if you have already N minus one mark points, Z1 up to Z N minus one, you have fixed where those are, then the next point can be anywhere but at those points. So you have this uh, general story here that the, the fiber of these projections 
are actually themselves canonically isomorphic to the, the Riemann surface that is given by the point in the base. Essentially, so for example, in genus one, what you would do, you, you have to integrate over all the configurations uh, of four points on an on a, on elliptic curve, or on a torus, say. Then you would integrate over the first one, keeping Z1, Z2, and Z3 fixed, and you're only integrating over the positions of the fourth. And then you go on step by step, you integrate one step at a time uh, until you're on, on M11, for example. Um, and I will come back to this later. But so the, using these vibrations at each stage, you're only integrating over a punctured Riemann surface. So if you have a good integration theory uh, on punctured Riemann surfaces, then you get for free via this tower of vibrations, you get for free an integration theory on these moduli spaces. Um, now let's uh, specialize to, to genus zero, uh, the tree level. Now, if you only have three marked points, then uh, you can use the, the automorphisms uh, of the Riemann sphere to fix them at zero, one, and infinity. So there's actually only a single uh, Riemann sphere with three marked points. Uh, the modular space is only a single point. Now, when you have one point more with four points, uh, this, this fourth point can be anywhere but at zero, one, and infinity. So M04 is essentially the plane punctured in zero and one. And if you have more points, you end up with a configuration space of N. Um, and points on C minus zero one. So that's just the, the product minus the diagonal. So no, no two points may be equal. And then the, the kind of string amplitudes you get in string perturbation theory uh, look like this. So you're integrating over these moduli spaces. Um, the integrand is, is a volume form. So for every dimension you have, so starting from the fourth marked point, uh, you, you integrate over the corresponding volume you have some rational function, uh, which can have poles on the diagonal, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic are allowed. And then you have a factor here um, that depends on, on the physics. So this Sij, this comes from momenta of the scattering particles, but that will not be too important uh, for the rest of the talk. Uh, and the precise form of this F is also dependent on the actual string theory you're looking at and the particles you're scattering. Um, let me just mention the, the most famous example probably of these closed tree level amplitudes is the Vera Zoro Shapiro amplitude. So here uh, you're scattering uh, for tachyons. And it turns out that if, if you write things in, uh, in a suitable form, you can actually explicitly work out this integral. You can write it in terms of uh, the gamma function. But in general, you, you don't have that kind of formulas for, for higher n. And all I'm going to talk about in this talk is, is the perturbation theory. So I will always expand in these passes and I will look at the low energy expansion and the coefficients in this expansion. Okay, so let's forget about this, this formula um, and let's look at the expansion step by step. So in the integrand, you have these factors Z i minus Zj absolute value to the minus two Sij so the product of this gives what's called the Coburn-Nielsen factor. And if you write it as exponential, you see that when you expand for small s's, you just get powers of the logarithm. And this logarithm you should think of as the Green's function on the Riemann sphere, this is why it's there. So essentially when you expand in the Sij's, um, all that's left to integrate um, is a function f, which remember from the beginning, it could have been a rational integrand and from the expansion, we get uh, logs uh, of these differences of points. So we get the products of Green's functions in the integrand. Um, and then if you now perform this integral one variable at a time, you get the situation from the very first slide. So if you want to compute these expansion coefficients, this is an example of the situation I want to look at. And this has been studied extremely well, of course. Um, and I don't know the entire history, so there's probably previous work on this as well that I'm not aware, but um, there has have been theorems by several groups uh, that study these objects. And the main result is whenever you have such an integral, whenever it converges, um, then it's of a particular type, so you can write it up to a certain power of two i pi. It's what's called a multiple zeta value. 
or a special type of multiple zeta value. Uh, so these you see here. So the these zeta values are generalizations of the Riemann zeta function. So if you have d equal one, it's literally just the Riemann zeta function. And if you have several variables, uh, that's what's called a multiple uh, zeta function or multiple zeta value. And then you take all of their all the rational linear combinations of these. This is what I call curly z. So this is this, the linear combinations of multiple zeta values. And the statement actually in this situation is a bit stronger. So you know more than just that you can evaluate these integrals in terms of zeta values. There's actually a subspace called single valued multiple zeta values, um, which is more constrained. Uh, but I, I don't want to talk too much about that. But this is the kind of theorem that uh, we want to understand and that we want to generalize to other situations. So let's, let's try to see how this comes about, this type of result. Um, oh no, actually, let, let me give another example. Yeah, I said in the beginning, I want to also give you a quantum field theory example of where this comes from, which may be a bit surprising. Uh, before we look, we look into the integration, let me just give a different situation. Uh, so now for, there's no strings involved. There's no string anywhere. You're doing Feynman integrals in R to the four, uh, for example, in phi to the four theory, um, the scattering Higgs particles or something that uh, was introduced by Oliver. This is called graphical functions. And these uh, are on their quantum field theoretical Feynman integrals in, in R4. And they have this uh, notation here. So think of a three point function points x1, x2, x3 uh, that are fixed points. You have chosen them somewhere in R to the four. And you integrate with the little point, the black vertex, the y, the inverse over all R4. And the propagators are just inverse squares of the differences. Um, so in a way, it looks a bit similar. Uh, but the problem is here now you're not, you're not integrating over a Riemann surface over a complex um, one dimensional space, you're integrating over R to the four. So this is really a very different type of integral. But the observation is that this thing is translation or rotation invariance. And if you exploit the scaling, you realize actually it really only depends on the relative position of these three points, X1 and X2 and X3 within. This time I lost you, Eric. Hmm. Hello, Eric. Can you hear me? Seems like we lost the connection. Yeah. We lost the audio at least. Uh, I, I think I lost the whole video too. Yeah, it's frozen here as well. Yeah, frozen there. Uh, I think it probably decided to disconnect and probably it's going to come back. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's hope that he comes back soon, I guess. And then There you are. You're muted, uh, Eric. Well, when did I lose you? Sorry. About two minutes ago. Yeah. <clears throat> was that on this slide or the slide before? Yeah, it was on this yeah, slide. Yeah, it was on this slide. Uh, yeah, before you put up the, you started with the example. Okay. Um, very good. So, that comes from quantum field theory by integrating over R to the four. Um, so you can use the, the translation rotation variance to, to think of, to parameterize these functions by complex coordinate. So you actually get a real analytic function of a complex variable. So think of one point at zero, another one at one, and the other, well, think of it as somewhere in the complex plane with the other coordinate zero. And it turns out that some of these functions you can actually compute. So this one, you can actually write down in this form 
where this D is, is what's called the Bloch-Wegener dialog rhythm. So it's a version of the dialog rhythm function. So, so you, have, you had this four-dimensional integral that turned out to be this, uh, this complex sphere analytic function. And now uh, you can do the following tricks. So suppose you want to integrate uh, a Feynman integral like the thing on the left-hand side. Um, so suppose, uh, let's look, only look at the integration of the last vertex. So if you already integrated the upper and the lower one, you still have to do the integral over X3. So that's a four-dimensional integral. But everything depends only on the complex number, right? On the two-dimensional part, which is the position of X3 with respect to the plane, the zero and one line. Um, so you can actually write this as a two-dimensional integral. So the integration measure changes like this. And now all of a sudden you're talking about an integral over the complex plane. So you've turned this four-dimensional integral into an integral over the complex plane. And uh, then you go, use what the propagators are. So the propagator between zero and Z, that's an absolute value that's squared between Z and minus one, that is one minus Z absolute value squared. Um, and then you see this, then you have these two parts of the integral, right? That there you have one vertex integrated with three ends and zero, one and Z. This is exactly the thing I showed you on the previous slide. So this is this Bloch-Wigner dialog rhythm function. So when you, when you plug this all in, you get this kind of integral, which is now a bit more generalized. So it's still integral over the complex plane with some holomorphic and anti-holomorphic denominators. And the numerator now is a bit more general. The numerator is not just a log of some absolute value squared, but it's a dialog rhythm, but you can still apply these kind of techniques. And turns out in this example, you get 20 zeta of five, which is indeed a zeta value. It's just a Riemann zeta value um, as a result. So I'm, I'm just showing this to, 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 to make you aware that some of these integrals that, that uh, actually contain information about actual quantum field theory. Um, and these me methods are used to compute beta functions and try to the four theory, for example, to, to large orders. Um, just a test, can anybody still hear me? I can. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> the connection um, seems to be okay, better so, now. Okay, so. Well, it's fingers crossed. Don't jinx it. Um, <laughs> okay. How can one understand how this goes? So, to compute such integral, what you first do, so this is what I refer to as single word integration, as is a method I'm from Oliver Schnitz. And it's just an idea of how to perform such integrals. So, so here on the left hand side, this is a integral from a value, you know, or the second one, right? Where the result was log of absolute value p squared, if you remember. So it turns out that you can actually write it in this factorized form. You can write it as a wedge of an anti holomorphic and a holomorphic uh, integrand. And then, of course, it's easy to find a primitive. You can write this as a differential of a one form simply by noticing that dz bar over z bar, well, that's just the differential of log of z bar. So the idea is, of course, you want to apply Stokes' theorem. Uh, but there's a couple problems with that. Because when you look at the situation here, well, the problem is that log of z bar is not actually a well-defined uh, function because it's multi-valued. Um, and if you have a multi-valued function, it doesn't really make sense to apply Stokes' theorem. So the next thing you have to do is to make it single-valued. And Francis Brown has given a prescription of how to do that in a very general context. So this situation is very simple. So what do you do? Well, you have log of Z bar and you just add log of Z to it. Obviously now this is log of absolute value Z squared and that, that, that is single valued indeed. Uh, also notice that it's still a primitive because what you've done is you've added a holomorphic function, a holomorphic one form. So of course it's differential is zero. So you you made the, the primitive single valued without changing the fact that indeed it's still, it is a form whose derivative is the thing that you want to integrate. And then the second thing you have to realize is that actually you have to be a bit careful when you apply Stokes theorem because your, your function has poles, right? So the singularities at one and P um, at zero from the log and also at infinity. So this is why you have this regularized Stokes thing. Um, so I think this, this was already mentioned also in the morning and response to some questions in the first talk, um, that when you want to do these integrals, the natural idea to do is to cut out a little hole around each, each singularity. 
Uh, now the good thing now is that you have an actual manifold with boundary and the, the form is smooth on this manifold. So you can really apply the Stokes theorem to this truncated uh, manifold that I've indicated here. And if, if you assume that the integral converges, which I would always assume here, uh, you can you know, just cut out less and less and make the outer circle bigger and bigger. And then you recover the actual value of the integral. Um, so in the end, what you have to do is you can indeed apply Stokes theorem and you're left with integrals uh, of a one form over all these circles. And you have to compute the limits. And in this case, it's, it's very easy when you look at it because uh, this thing vanishes, the form here vanishes at infinity, the log of that vanishes at one. At zero, there is a logarithmic singularity, but the form is smooth, so there's no contribution there. So in the end, here you only get a contribution from the integral around P, where uh, this holomorphic part, the, the one form here in the bracket parentheses gives you a two pi i, and the integrand is at this point, it becomes log of P squared. So this is the idea of how to compute these, uh, these integrals. And um, so what, what do you have to do when you want to do this systematically? Well, you have to, to solve these problems, right? So you have to be able to find primitives. You have to be able to make them single valued. And you want to be able to, to calculate these, these uh, integrals over these little circles. Um, so for the first problem, how do you find primitives? This is where the iterated integrals come in. So this goes back to the, to the work of Chen. So the idea is just, you start with a couple of differential forms on your Riemann surface, and I will always assume them to be holomorphic uh, differentials. You can be more general, but I will, it will be sufficient for all examples that I've shown to use holomorphic forms. So this capital W is like some family of, of differential forms you have to choose in a smart way. But suppose you've chosen W, then what you can do is you look at these iterate integrals. So you have a path and then you first integrate a form, one form over the path. And that in itself defines a function on the path that you can then integrate again over the path. So I'll give an example in a second. Uh, what happens in the end, you get a function that depends on the endpoints uh, of the path obviously, but it's also multi-valued due to the choices of branch um, that you can do. So for this first part of the talk, the problem is solved by what's called the hyperlogarithms. So what you do here, so we're on the Riemann surface, which is uh, a punctured plane. And we take these differential forms, dz over z minus sigma. Um, so here's some examples. So for example, if you take dt over t minus one, just a single form, then this is just the ordinary integral. So you get log of one minus z. And of course you see that my notation is a bit misleading. So I, I write integral from zero to z. What I should really write is an integral along a path because the right-hand side, the function, it's not well-defined. It depends on, it's only defined up to two pi i. And it dep really depends on the actual path that I'm choosing uh, what the result is. But anyway, let me use this shorthand here. So then what is this double iterated integral, which looks a bit weird here, but what does it mean? It means if you first integrate the, the rightmost one, the dt over t minus one, and that gives you this logarithm that I've just shown you. And now you integrate this function from the first integration against dt over t. And this gives you a new function and that's called the dilogarithm uh, function. And so you can keep going. And it's very easy to see when you sit down that if you define these, if you look at all of these iterate integrals of this form, then you can always find a primitive because you can use integration by parts to, to, to reduce whatever rational prefactor you have to the simple pole. Um, so, so the upshot is that you get a class of functions which are called multiple polylogarithms. So you have these, these rational prefactors and then you look at these iterated integrals over of any length, so you can have single, double, triple, whatever higher fold integrals of these one forms. Uh, and at first this gives you functions on a punctured plane, but then using this vibration idea and these forgetful maps that forget a single point, you can do this fiber by fiber of these forgetful maps. And you can define a class of functions on the moduli space M0n 
And these functions are called multiple poly logarithms. And then there's a couple of results uh, by Francis Brown on these functions. So the first result is, as I said, and you can check that indeed in this function space, uh, you can always find a primitive. So this, uh, so this is for, for a holomorphic form. Yeah? So if you have a holomorphic, uh, holomorphic one form, everything here so far is holomorphic. You can find a, a function whose derivative um, is that. But uh, this function does not need to be single valued in general. So you have to do more. Remember to, to get the single value thing, we, we had to add the complex conjugate of a function. So what you do is you work on this algebra, which is the tensor product of the holomorphic polylogarithms and the anti-holomorphic polylogarithms. So this is where you get this expression that I had on the first slide. So the functions in this algebra are linear combinations uh, of multiple polylogarithms, which themselves are iterated integrals of these uh, hyperlogarithm forms, dz over z minus sigma, times anti-holomorphic polylogarithms. And they have some coefficients. So these coefficients can be rational functions in z and z bar. So I'm, I'm really only worried and writing out these uh, iterate integrals, the transcendental part. And then the segment is that you can generalize this idea of adding the complex conjugate. I mean, obviously it's, it's much more tricky, but there is a recursive procedure uni exploiting the unipotency of the monotony of this function algebra that allows you to, to show that whenever you start with a single valued function, so you, you start with a function in this product form, holomorphic and holomorphic, which is well-defined. So you assume that little f is well-defined. Then you can find a one form f, capital F dz, which is a primitive of this two form that you want to integrate. So, so this is the function algebra where you can perform Stokes theorem. And then uh, doing these, these uh, integrals over these circles and the limits, this just generalizes to some generalized notion of residue, uh, generalizing what, what, was, what we have seen this morning if you managed to, to come to the first talk. And then the upshot is that in the end, if, if you've done all these vibrations here and you're down to only M04, right? So you only have C punctured in zero and one. Um, so all you can do is then in the end to evaluate, take these residues of your function at zero, one or infinity. And all of these integrals turn out to be multiple zeta values. So this is how you can prove this, uh, this theorem that I showed earlier. There's other way to prove this as I mentioned, but uh, this is one idea. So the key, key step here is to, to find a function algebra that is big enough to, to allow you to construct primitives and make them single valued. And at the same time, it should be minimal in the sense that of course you, you wanna get the tightest possible control of these, on these functions in order to say as much as possible uh, about the result. So it turns out that you can actually do this a bit more carefully and be a bit more constrained about what you do to these coefficients. And then you can even end in the subalgebra of what I had on a previous slide called single valued multiple zeta values. But I don't wanna talk about that too much because the, the way that I pre uh, presented it, it generalizes to, to other situations pretty straightforwardly. Whereas when you wanna be more precise about these coefficients, you have to be a bit more careful. Are, are there any questions about these general principles here? Because now I'm going to, to talk about generalization. So that if there's any questions regarding um, I, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. So you 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 gave an example where you to write the primitive you had a log z and then you observed that um, log z is not a not single value so you can't apply Stokes theorem. So you added a log z bar to make it single value. Now to me that looks like you just changed the problem. Why didn't you just start with that problem? I mean, you, I don't see I don't see what we learned about the original integral with the dz over z. Yeah. So the thing is, we didn't change the integral. So let me go back to this slide. So we want to compute this integral in the first row here. Yeah. So this dz bar over z bar wedge thing, um, and we've written it in this form: d of log z bar 
times dz over z minus one minus dz over z minus p. And now indeed we change uh, this form, we add the log z, but the point is that this is still a primitive to the initial two form. Yeah, so if I take the differential. Okay, thank you. Yeah, got yeah. it. It seems like cheating, but it's not. It's really, you could have also said, I just made a stupid choice. Why did I choose log z bar? I could have chosen log z bar plus log z from the beginning. Of course, that, that's what you probably would do if you do it by hand. But to just illustrate the general idea is that, first of all, in the first step of the general procedure, you would just operate, say, with only the anti-holomorphic part, say. Then you can use the definition of hyperlogarithms to find a primitive. And then because you separated this holomorphic and anti-holomorphic dependence and you only have a dz but no dz bar, you are then free to add holomorphic bits. And you can show that there is enough freedom within the holomorphic bits to cancel any monotony you might have created. Indeed, very good question, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, can I ask uh, a question? Can I ask? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I don't know who was first, please just go ahead. Yeah, in the previous page. Uh, yeah, uh, in the last line, could you explain this notation? I didn't understand, dt by t and another dt by t minus one, sorry. Yeah, it's... So Sorry, I mean, the, it, it's, it's probably better to see in this line on the top. Yeah, so what you should think of, you have a couple of differential forms. So this omega one up to omega, these are differential one forms. Yeah. And it's really just a string. Think of, think of a word, just a sequence of one forms. Okay. Um, so you should think of this, this is not a, on the bottom here, this dt over t, dt over t minus one, this is not a two form. You should right. just think of it as two one forms written one after the other. Um, okay. And it means what I've written here. So it means that first take the rightmost one and integrate that. You get a new function, log of, log of t minus one. Yeah. And now take this function, multiply it with the next one form. So this is still a one form, which now has a transcendental coefficient function. But your limits and, are still the same. Yes. So this is, no. this, this is an iterate integral. So you always integrate to the next variable. Uh, so is, if you look here in the, in the, in the top row, Right, so the t1, the first integration goes from zero to t2. So the upper limit of the first integration of the innermost integration is exactly the next integration. Okay, level. yeah, I understand, thank you, yeah. Welcome. Sorry, this was, yeah. Uh, I think there was one more rather, question. Yeah. Yeah. I had a rather trivial question. So if I look at your integral, and I don't think too much, it's independent of p bar. So if I take its p bar derivative, I get zero. The fact that your answer does not de does depend on p bar means that you assumed something about the way you manipulated the integral. So what is it? I, I, the, an the, answer I need, the answer I need is at the level of calculus 101, not yeah. more sophisticated than that. Yeah, th th thank you very much. This is an excellent question. So yeah, actually I should have mentioned this earlier. So if you look at this integral, right, on the left-hand side, on the very top left-hand side, the integrand is a holomorphic function of p. So if you're naive and you just uh, don't worry about commuting differentiation with integration signs, then you could think, well, let's apply the anti-holomorphic derivative with respect to P, then the integrand becomes zero because it's holomorphic in P. But actually the resulting, the result of the integral is real analytic, right? It does depend on P bar. So the reason for this is that this integral, it is convergent, it is absolutely convergent. But then you apply a, I mean, you still have though these logarithmic singularities at these punctures. And now when you apply derivatives, the problem is that you can make the, the integral divergent. Yeah, so you can introduce higher order poles. So for example, if you take a derivative with respect to P, yeah, um, then this would become a dz over z minus P squared. Um, so now you have a double pole if that equals P and that of course is not integrable anymore. So indeed you have to be very careful, you cannot um, do these, these formal manipulations and uh, differentiate under the integral sign in the simple way. There's a way to, to understand what the dependence on P bar is also in these cases, but it's much more subtle. So, so what, what I would say that the reason why this looks surprising is indeed because this integral is convergent, but it's only just convergent. So it's not convergent enough that you have the freedom to differentiate under the integral sign. 
Okay. This must assume something about the answer. We impose some condition on the answer. I mean, I'm assuming I'm using the fact that this integral converges, but it's absolutely convergent. This, so you don't need to bag, but this is a Riemann convergent integral, but it has logarithmic singularities. Um, and then you have to be careful. So as a one form, because it wouldn't be, a, I mean, if you have a one form of the pole, it would be divergent, right? But as a two form, you can have these things which are convergent. Okay, I, as I just go on because I, I'm basically almost at the end of my talk. So uh, let me just try to say a couple more things. Um, so the so basic idea here is that uh, we introduce the new space of functions, these multiple pole logarithms. Um, but, but the good thing about these pole logarithms is that even though they're quite a big space of functions, they're very well understood. You can manipulate them very easily. They're linearly independent. Um, and we completely understand the constants that we get in the end. They're always of this multiple zeta value form. And these multiple zeta values are extremely well studied numbers that appear in many branches of mathematical physics. Uh, so we can be very happy with this kind of a result. So now let me uh, generalize the situation in one direction. Um, so here I'm taking an example from deformation quantization uh, following Concevich's approach. Um, so here, um, if, if, if you know deformation quantization, this will be very familiar. So the idea is you, you have a Poisson manifold and you want to define a product denoted star between functions uh, on your Poisson manifold as a formal power series in the Planck's constant H bar uh, in such a way that it um, deforms the commutative product and uh, the Poisson bracket comes in as the first correction to commutativity. Um, so the experts, have, you know, there's much more behind the story. So um, these these constructions, there's a formality theorem between the poly differential, uh, the poly vector fields, and the DGLA of poly differential operators. And there's a Poisson sigma model by Katani and Felder behind that was also mentioned already this morning. Um, so these integrals that I'm going to talk about here, they they have quite a number of applications. But let me just say for for this purpose here. Um, what, what you got to do here to compute this star product, for example, is uh, there's two ingredients. So you're summing over graphs. So there's a graphical expansion in terms of kind of Feynman type of integrals in a way. So you have these graphs which have two blue vertices and a couple of black vertices. And you should think of the, the blue vertices representing F and G. So this graph without a black vertex with n equals zero, just the two blue vertices. This corresponds to the f times g in the product. And then this graph, which has a single black vertex, this corresponds to the ih bar to the power one because one black vertex. Then you have a half and the Poisson bracket. And then all these other graphs here would give you the h bar squared correction and so on. So I don't want to talk about uh, these things in too much detail. They, all I want to say is that this is a different construction where a type of coefficient, these WGs appear, which again are string, string kind of integrals, integrals over Riemann surface, but now about a different, over a different one. And that changes some aspects of the, of the calculation. So let me talk about these integrals. So what you do is um, you have this graph and you have the blue left and right, these blue vertices is n, you have a coordinate in the upper half plane. And then for this integral, you're integrating over all the configurations of these endpoints in the upper half plane. And what you do is for every edge in your graph, you wedge together this one form that you get from the argument. So the difference of the two angles between z i z j and z i bar minus z j. Um, so, so notice that this is a different situation because here you Previously, we only had z i's minus the j's and z i bars minus the j bars. But now we have a mixture between the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic coordinates, the z i bar minus the j. So something is different. Um, and it turns out that the result is still very similar. So, so these integrals 
uh, over over the disks. I mean, the upper half plane just different model for the disk. Over configurations on the disk, um, still give multiple zeta values. The, these powers of i pi, they're just because they're already in these differential forms, so don't worry about them too much. Uh, the difference, though, is that now you really get all zeta values. Previously, I, I had maybe mentioned that in the previous situation, you only get what's called single-valued multiple zeta values. Uh, and for example, zeta 3,5 would not be single-valued. But now, if you look at disk integrals, you really get all the zeta values, in particular also that one. So let me just illustrate what, what is different now. So here I, I give you the example of the very first integral of this one graph. So when you work out these, these one forms, so you have log of z over z bar and log of z minus one over z bar minus one. Um, so, so what happens is that your Riemann surface is very different now. Um, so for one thing, you have now a boundary on, on the real line or the boundary of the disk. Um, which wasn't there before. So in this particular example, it doesn't play a role. I, I've chosen the primitive uh, such that when z is z bar, you see it here, the form is actually zero. So the way I've chosen my form, my primitive, you only get a contribution from this half integral, this half circle around infinity. So uh, let's say another five minutes. Or so. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so, so just focus on the differences here. So there's a, this, this half circle, uh, but in general, you will also get integrals over these parts of the real line. And then the other thing you have to notice is that there are these annoying corners. So actually this is strictly not a Riemann, uh, not a manifold with boundary anymore. This is a manifold with corners. And now I have a problem when you apply Stokes theorem to this thing with the corners, then when you send the limit, when, when this cutout goes to zero, you can actually have singularity. So this integral over this little half circle here itself could, could become infinite when you, when you send the radius to zero. But that would cancel against an, another opposite infinity that comes from this line integral along the real line. So you have to choose consistent regularizations. And we do this with what's called tangential base points uh, to really make sure you add up everything in a correct way to get the correct result. But uh, the, the upshot is that this is all doable, uh, but you, you have a different geometry now. So previously what we have done is um, we have taken the holomorphic polylogarithms and then we took the anti-holomorphic polylogarithms, the complex conjugates, and we looked at bilinear expressions in these. So we had a factorization into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic factors from the very first slide also from the top. Now we can't do that anymore because we have these zi's minus zj bars so instead, what we do is we do this doubling trick. So you take the disk, you take the complex conjugate disk, and you glue them together along the boundary. So what, you, what that means is that for every point in the upper half plane, you get its mirror image in the lower half plane, and you treat it as a separate variable. So you double the number of variables. Uh, and now you're working in this big moduli space. Um, and now, by construction, the differential forms live on the space and you can consider them, th them there. But it's a bit weird now is that at each integration, you're actually losing two coordinates in this moduli space. Um, but because you're still working with multiple polylogarithms, the results from, previous, from the previous slides remain true. So you can find primitives, you can still make them single valued. And the really only new changes are for this regular Stokes theorem. You have to be a lot more careful because of these new boundaries and corners. Um, so this was one way to generalize the, the previous, the, 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 the traditional story by adding a boundary. Uh, let me just say one word um, or two about uh, the elliptic case. So when you go to genus one, so now you're on an elliptic curve, um, the idea is that you first integrate over the punctures and then at the very end only you integrate over the modulus. Uh, so you're integrating over configurations on an elliptic curve. Uh, that's what I call this B function here. And that will leads to a huge zoo of uh, special functions uh, that have been given different names. Um, but they are all just another re incarnation of the very same principle that I've shown you at the beginning of the talk. 
Um, so what you what you do is you, you look at these integrals. This should remind you of the genus tree zero, the tree level case at the very beginning. Um, so you're integrating over the, the, the points on, on, on an elliptic curve. Now I have a fixed elliptic curve with a given modulus. And you're integrating now these Green's functions, which are now different. So this is this Green's function. Previously, it was just log of z squared. Now it's uh, an elliptic function uh, that you can write in this form, for example. But when you do the low energy expansion SIJs, it's still true that uh, you get these uh, the coefficients of the low energy expanders will be integrals of certain polynomials in these Green's functions. And, and these objects are called modular graph functions. They're very interesting because they are modular functions, but they're not holomorphic anymore. They are real analytic. But you see the similarity here. So it's a very parallel story. And so um, we just finish maybe on, on, on this slide that uh, you can play the same game. So there is now an elliptic version of polylogarithms um, where you take <coughs> iterate integrals uh, of uh, theta functions and the Weierstrass p function. And then you do the same thing. You take the complex conjugates and then you show the exist single value primitives and you can um, do the same steps and get a structural result for, for these integrals over uh, configurations on an elliptic curve. Yeah, I think I should stop here because my, my time has run out. So uh, thanks very much. I hope I didn't disconnect again. <laughs> um, okay. Well, thank you very much, Eric, for, um, uh, for a very interesting talk. Uh, let's all thank the speaker. So I'll put a little clap reaction here. Are there any questions? Uh, so yes, Greg Moore is asking a question. Go ahead, Greg. Have you thought about trying to apply your methods to uh, um, theta lifts and things like that in analytic number theory? Uh, no. And um, I yeah. wouldn't really know what that would entail, I'm afraid. Seems similar to the general structure you're having. And I had a related question, which is, um, is another application of these ideas possibly to what are called cool branch or U-plane integrals. You thought about that at all? Um, no. So uh, what would these, uh, what would the difference be in these integrals? Well, it's a very similar story where you're trying to integrate over some um, domain, some modular curve of uh, a uh, one, one form, which you sometimes formally write as a, uh, D of something, but it's not single value. And then there's some um, art to trying to find a good single value primitive. Yeah, so so I would have to think about that in detail, right? So the, the this is exactly the tricky point, right? You want to have a, a good theory of these inter integrals that it, so, so that you have a general theory and an algorithmic way of finding these single value primitives. Well, people have discussed the integrals that I'm talking about, but the discussions tend to be in terms of things like mock modular forms. Um, and I was just wondering if um, your way of trying to express things in terms of iterated integrals might lead to uh, a new alternative way of doing these, uh, these integrals. Yeah, so, so I think, think that's, that's a great tip. I must admit, I haven't really looked into these things in detail. Um, I mean, there is a modular end to this elliptic story even. So, right, so when, once you're done integrating over the configurations on the fixed elliptic curve, you end up with this real analytic modular form. Um, and those you can write as themselves as iterated integrals um, of, uh, of holomorphic modular forms and their enter holomorphic conjugates. Um, so I, I didn't have time to talk about this, but there is a story that looks at these techniques also in the modular case. And that's again, something that's been developed by Francis Brown uh, in detail, but I don't know, I, I cannot say anything definite uh, for these particular applications you mentioned, but, but thanks very much. Um, and we have another yeah. question from Pedro Vieira. 
Hi. Uh, yes, just a quick question. So, is it true that uh, this story that you told about would show up a lot in physics in even dimensions, but in odd dimensions, the story would be uh, a little bit different? And if so, could you say a few words about uh, odd dimensions? Yeah. Mm. Maybe the best way to show this is when I go back to... So I had one field theory example, right? So everything was string theory except for this uh, Feynman integral <coughs> slide here. So, so, so this was a four-dimensional Feynman integral, right? So I was integrating over R4, and that's neat. But now let, let look at this thing here. So here what I've done is I, I've written this four-dimensional integral of this function that only depends on, uh, on a complex coordinate as an integral over the complex plane. And I have this z minus z bar squared here. So this comes for, this is a kind of ground determinant. This, this comes from, from the measure. Um, now, if you do that in all dimensions, so what you, the exponent here really should be, I think, d over two or, or something like that. Um, or even if, if, you, if you just take it even, if you would just have the absolute value, right? And you, you would like to, to write that, uh, you get some square roots if you write it out in terms of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic coordinates. And then you're in a, in a new space of integrals. Uh, also, um, also here, right? You, if, if this would be two dimensional, you would get square roots in these expressions. Now, the, the difference then is that you cannot start the, the recursion because the, this is a kind of recursive procedure. You, you say, you assume I have a poly logarithm. I have an iterate integral of a certain type. Now I'm integrating again with a certain kernel that is of a certain form. Then I can prove I have a closure and I still get an integral of the same type. Now, if you have a new kernel, if you introduce these square roots, these algebraic extensions, and then you get a new space of functions and you have to do a new theory of iterate integrals with these uh, more general kernels. Now, so that means that you get a richer class of functions uh, it does not mean that it's impossible to, to understand certain subclasses of these conceptually. Uh, and I think people are looking into that. So, um, so say for the simplest ones, like the analog of the classical polylogs, but uh, slightly generalized to be the ones that would show up in 3D, say, this would be known. And uh, not in, 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 in full generality, no. So there's no. actually in three dimensions. So all of these integrals that I've, so in four dimensions, this technology is really very advanced and you can do a lot, but even in four dimensions, there is limits. Um, and in all dimensions, you see the limits very early on. And there's many simple looking integrals. Uh, I remember recent gravity, gravitational wave calculations where some three dimensional integrals were needed. And it was quite embarrassing for the quantum field theory community that they couldn't really give much other than numerical expansions. Uh, so this is, I think to the best of my knowledge, still quite unexplored territory. So there's a lot of special tricks and a couple of particular examples, but there's not a general theory that would be as satisfying as this, I'm afraid. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt. I see there are further questions, but perhaps they should be um, uh, put into the chat because I think at this point we should move on. So let's, let's thank the speaker again uh, for a very interesting talk. Thank you.